Apocalypse chapter 6, and um, we commence the consideration of the fifth seal from verse 9 onwards. When he had opened the fifth seal, John said, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And we began our thoughts by looking at the altar as it was described in verse 9. And you'll see it in the picture which has been painted. A graphic way that we've got the altar, although it's not designated which one it was, we are assuming perhaps it was the altar of burnt offering which John was privileged to see, based on the assumption of the souls under the altar which had been slain for the testimony which they held. I feel it was more appropriate, perhaps, that that altar should be represented than the golden altar of incense, which appears later on in the Apocalypse, to uh, symbolise the prayer of the saints. And we began to look at the details given to us in the scripture concerning the law relative to the altar. Remember, we'd seen from the book of Exodus that it had to be a specific type of altar that it could not be shaped by human device when it was of earth. Um, let's just recall it in Exodus chapter 20, just to refresh our minds. Exodus chapter 20, where there before the tabernacle was introduced, we've got an altar of earth shalt thou make unto me, verse 24, and shall sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings and thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thine oxen. In all the places where I record my name, I will come unto thee and I will bless thee. And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone, for if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. Then we saw the principle as the law of the altar was given to us in Exodus chapter 29 while we're in Exodus just again let's look at that where we have the principle of the burnt offering and in verse 37 of Exodus 29 seven days thou shalt make an atonement for the altar and sanctify it it shall be an altar most holy Whatsoever touches the altar shall be holy. That was the principle which we saw underlined by the law, that the, ho the altar was holy, and whatsoever touches the altar shall be holy. Now we took our thoughts forward to Hebrews chapter 13, where the Apostle Paul reminds us in verse 10 we have an altar whereof they have no right to each which serve the tabernacle so as far as we are concerned and as far as the brethren and sisters have been concerned since the days of the Lord Jesus the things of the mosaic altar have been replaced in him the true altar so when we take the symbol back to the Apocalypse and chapter 6, although perhaps for a graphic illustration it's right to represent the altar as the altar of burnt sac sacrifice, it is fairly obvious that that had been replaced by the Christ altar. Because those that had been slain, whose bodies were under the altar, had been slain for the word of God, says verse 9, and for the testimony which they held. Now if Christ is our altar, whosoever toucheth him, in other words, toucheth the altar, shall be holy. And therefore, through the waters of baptism, we have touched the Christ altar. 
Now we could go back to Romans chapter 6, but the principle you all know, brethren and sisters, as we come out of the waters of baptism, we have come to a newness of life. And Paul goes on in Romans chapter 6 to remind us that instead of serving King Sin, which we did in our former way of life, we are now serving King Righteousness. And no man can serve two masters. And therefore the principle which the Apostle brings out in Romans chapter 6 is because now we have gone through the waters of baptism, have associated ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, with the altar, we are now deemed holy. Our sins have been washed away. We stand accepted in the sight of God because of the redemptive work which the Master has accomplished. And therefore, through baptism, having touched the altar, we are deemed holy. And again, we emphasize the fact that the law of the altar of Exodus 29 didn't give us a choice. It didn't say you can or perhaps or maybe or could become holy. You will be holy. That was the law of the altar. And that's the position in Romans chapter 6 which the Apostle Paul put all those who have gone through the waters of baptism. Tragically, we obviously don't live up to that high calling to which we have been called. But thanks be to God that we have a mediator in the Lord Jesus Christ and as the Apostle John says in his first chapter of his first epistle that if we are willing to confess our sins he is willing to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so we can still be holy in his sight. That's the principle of the redemptive work we have in him which we remember Sunday by Sunday. Now, take that thought to verse 9 of chapter 6. Here we've got those whose souls, whose lives, were slain for the word of God and they were seen to be under the altar. Now the normal way of sacrifice was that the sacrifice was um, by the horns of the altar was tied down and the blood obviously then sprinkled the altar as the sacrifice was slain before it was consumed. Here we've got a difference. Instead of being on top of the altar, the souls, the men and the women, were seen to be under the altar. Now it's fairly obviously what it's representing, but I want you to just think a second why they were specifically mentioned as being under the altar. Now if the altar is Christ and if by our baptism into Christ we have touched the altar to me the, symboli the symbolism of being under the altar are those who are sleeping in Christ. We were buried with him in baptism by touching the altar but now through, obviously through these who had been slain as martyrs for the gospel which they held, they were in effect under the altar, and therefore I suggest it is representing those who are sleeping in Christ, awaiting the resurrection. Now, while we think upon that, now let's go back to Genesis chapter 4. Cain and Abel the first murder being committed when a quarter of the earth's population was perhaps destroyed in that day if we assume the, the, the Genesis record being so that there was only four people alive at that point in time upon the earth and when Cain killed Abel we find that in verse 9 God asks him a question where is Abel thy brother and he says I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Now, of course, he wasn't literal. There was no voice to be heard. But we understand what is meant. God knew 
what Cain had done and it was therefore in effect the voice of Abel crying out because of the terrible uh, deed which Cain had performed and therefore Genesis chapter 4 and verse 10 speaks of it as the voice of thy blood, brother's blood crying unto me from the ground come back to Apocalypse chapter 6 and we see a similar idea here I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they heard and they cried with a loud voice saying how long O Lord holy and true not in a literal sense there was no voice to be heard but of course it was their plea that God would truly judge and avenge their blood upon them that dwell upon the earth in exactly the same way as Genesis provides us with the, the, the fact that Abel's blood in effect was crying from the ground to God that is the reason I believe we have no living creature opening this fifth seal remember I asked you to ponder it last time <coughs> And up to the first four seals, not only have we seen the, symbolis the symbolism of the horse, but we had one of the living creatures always opening for us the seal. But now in the fifth seal, no such thing. And my feeling and my suggestion to you as to why this is so, is prior to the fifth seal, John was caused to review the things that was happening within the Roman Empire relative to the power who was in control and the saints were onlookers to the events but now in the ninth verse of chapter 6 they were the subject matter of the event it was they who were being persecuted it was they who had been put to death it's not relating for us any aspect of the Roman Empire apart from the fact that Rome had put them to death but instead of being onlookers to the scene under the white, red or black horse or whatever they were now the subject of the scene and therefore it would have been in effect those who had been slain were crying to God so that vengeance could be poured out as I said to you last time, I don't believe it's for the reason some suggest that the Ecclesia had lost its spirit power. I believe, as I said to you, that that spirit power had been lost many years prior to this time. Neither do I feel it's because there was no truth whatsoever in the earth that the whole Ecclesial scene had become apostate not only does verse 9 indicate some faithful ones but also in verse 11 when we come to it it speaks of the brethren and there I believe the brethren as opposed to the fellow servants also include a faithful remnant and therefore discounting those two views which are normally the reason for the uh, 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 admission of the uh, living creature I submit to you for consideration that the reason for it is because the saints themselves become the uh, very subject of the fifth seal perhaps we might talk about that later but what they cry is also very interesting they cry how long O Lord holy and true dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell upon the earth now if you go back to Luke chapter 18 which I'm sure you've already gone to in thought in Luke chapter 18 verse 1 he spake a parable unto them to this end men ought always to pray and not to faint saying there was a judge in a city who feared not God neither regarded man and there was a widow in that city and she came unto him saying avenge me of mine adversary and he would not for a while but afterward he said within himself though I fear not God nor regard man yet because this widow troubleth me I will avenge her 
lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry night and day unto them, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith upon the earth. So to answer the question, shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry night and day unto him? Of course he will. Because in the book of Hebrews we find, if you'd like to tie up the thought, Um, come on brethren who's the who's the uh, finder it's uh, vengeance is mine I will repay said it was probably going to be one of those nights. Want to just... 10.30? Uh, 10 10 10 10 That's right. Right, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29 for the connection. How much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified and holy thing, hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace, for we know him that saith, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So as the unjust judge rightly exclaimed, God will avenge his elect, which cry night and day unto him. So when this cry from under the altar in Apocalypse chapter 6 under the fifth seal their plea was how long O Lord dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell upon the earth there was going to be no doubt that he would the question they asked how long now let's go back to Romans chapter 12 for a second where quoting again the fact of vengeance belongs unto him in Romans chapter 12 and verse 19 you'll notice what the apostle says there dearly beloved Romans 12 verse 19 avenge not yourselves but rather give place unto wrath for it is written vengeance is mine I will repay saith the Lord therefore if thine enemy hunger feed him. If he thirst, give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now we've got to appreciate the faith of these brethren and sisters who had been slain for the testimony which they held. They had to accept that vengeance belonged unto God, but also that they themselves could not exact the judgment. They had to give way, as the Apostle says, unto their wrath, unto the wrath of the adversaries, so that they might render good for evil. Now, as we've said so often, it's easy for me to sit here and for you to sit round tables, very comfortable, and say, so, well, of course, we know that to be so. But you only actually are in the midst of the persecution and the affliction and being put to death. It's very, very difficult to uphold these principles, and yet, You'll notice in the Apocalypse and chapter 6 it's the souls from under the altar who are crying to him how long, how, how, lo how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge? That accepted it was his prerogative and his position for vengeance, not theirs. And again, 
in these days we can take exaltation, although we're not faced with exactly the same problem, we sometimes can feel that we need to exact vengeance. Somebody does something across us, or whatever the case may be. We accept that all things are in his hand, therefore he will render the vengeance if necessary. But coming back to Habakkuk chapter 1, Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1 says, The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. And he cries, O Yahweh, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save? Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance, for spoiling and violence are before me? And there are that that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth, for the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. And we can understand the feelings of the prophet here. He'd gone amongst the nation of Israel, and he had seen the wickedness and the abomination which they had committed. And no doubt on many, many occasions he had pleaded for God to do something about it. And now he cries, how long shall I cry? And they won't hear. As if God had turned a deaf ear to the pleadings of the prophet. Now how many months, or perhaps even years, Habakkuk had prayed to God for vengeance to come upon them, to punish them their iniquity, we don't know but we can understand how he feels. Because we sometimes, brothers and sisters, also pray very earnestly for a particular matter. We also perhaps sometimes feel that God hasn't heard or he hasn't answered. And we can perhaps become exasperated just like the prophet. How long must I keep going on? The consolation which we can take from the Apocalypse in chapter 6 is that God does hear and he will answer. Because in verse 10, when they cry to him, how long? He gives them the answer in verse 11. White robes were given unto every one of them and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. What an answer. Here the voice of those who were being put to death were crying to God how long before you reap judgment upon those our adversaries? And the answer is rest for a little while because there's many more of you also to be killed. Now we wouldn't probably find that very consoling. On the contrary, we would find it very difficult to accept. But this is one of the basic teachings of the scriptures. God does hear and God will answer, but not always in the way that we might desire. Here, no doubt, the ones who had cried unto him expected that he would soon bring swift judgment so that their oppression might be lifted and they could, the those who were still alive, could live out their lives in peace. But contrary to that, the answer was given, there's many more yet to be killed. And again, brothers and sisters, we must take the lesson which is being put here for our learning, that God will answer according to his will. It's the same when the Master was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but thine. There's no question. The drops of blood which fell from his forehead 
were indicative of the master's desire that the cup should pass. But he accepted if it was the will of God that it must be so, then it would be. And it was the Father's will that the Master should die for your sakes and for mine. And therefore the Master accepted that as the answer to his prayer. And so here, although perhaps it wasn't what they expected, nevertheless it was the will of the Father. And it's the same with our prayers. We might feel we have a very genuine case to ask for this or the other. And we perhaps might be so perplexed why God doesn't seem to give us the answer, or if he does, it seems to be in the opposite direction to what we were thinking. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts, and his ways than ours. But the point we want to emphasize from verse, nine, uh, from verse 10 is that their prayer was answered. Now, let's go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Two Thessalonians chapter two Verse five Remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he is taken out of the way and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all powers and signs and lying wonders now we know the one who is going to be revealed as that wicked one in verse 8 but it's verse 7 I want you to notice the mystery of iniquity doth already work only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way now who's the apostle Paul referring to? well he's not referring to the wicked one because it's when he that shall be taken out of the way is taken then the wicked one is revealed so he's not speaking of the Catholic system so who is he referring to when the mystery of iniquity doth work he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way well to me there can only be one answer in regard to what was happening from the days of the apostles until that wicked one should be established in the earth there was only one power who could let or forbid anything and that was the power who was in charge of the world affairs at that point in time which of course was Rome and I believe the Apostle Paul is making an allusion here to the fact that pagan Rome would be in control of all things until it was taken out of the way so that that wicked one could be revealed whom the Lord would eventually destroy with the brightness of his coming and therefore there is the promise, I was going to say the prophecy, I suppose it's both. The fact which Paul establishes here that one was to be taken out of the way in order for the other to be established. Now up to this point in time the brethren and sisters of the Lord Jesus Christ, the same as the rest of the peoples upon the earth, have been under the power of pagan Rome. And therefore, although we've got a brief period under the first seal, when the uh, truth, the uh, Christianity spread throughout the then known world, the brethren and sisters suffered the persecutions and suffered the trials the rest of the people did. But now was going to come the time when pagan Rome was to be taken out of the way. And I just wonder, and it's purely a thought, I just wonder how many may have understood in these days when they first heard of these things of Revelation chapter 6 the importance of Paul's words in 2 Thessalonians 2. 
about to arrive on the scene was that wicked one the man of sin and I just wondered if they appreciated the fact that this point in time was now going to see the end of pagan Rome we shan't know until at the judgment we shall be able to ask them but it is significant that even something which was about to happen was already foretold because God will do nothing unless he reveals it to his servants the prophets but I want us to come back to the sixth chapter of the apocalypse I want us to look at the word Lord in verse 10 how long O Lord holy and true and the word is better rendered as despot it means an owner a ruler a master or a king but it's the word despot now we would normally use a despot in an evil way we think of Hitler as being a despot we think of perhaps Napoleon being a despot and we think of the people who were in control of the government of the Roman Empire at that time as also being a despot but here the brethren and sisters who had been slain for the testimony which they held they cry how long O despot holy and true dost thou not judge and avenge our blood upon them that dwell upon the earth now they had refused to submit to the despot of the earth that's why they've been slain they'd refused to give up their beliefs for the sake of their lives and therefore they had shown by their very actions that they weren't willing to submit to the despot of the earth but the despot of heaven now if you go back to Luke chapter 2 the very word there in verse 29 of Luke chapter 2 is used of God himself it's in Luke, 20, Luke 2 and verse 29 when the babe Jesus had been brought to Simeon in the temple and he says Lord despot now lettest thy servant depart in peace according to thy word if you go to the second epistle of Peter in chapter 2 and verse 1 it's used in reference to the Lord Jesus Christ 2 Peter 2 and verse 1 you notice the context in which Peter uses it which is interesting this one says there were false prophets also among the people even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies even denying the despot that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction it's also the word which is quoted by Paul to Timothy in the first of Timothy and chapter 6 in verses 1 and 2 where he says let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own despots worthy of all honour translated masters in the authorised version and then again in verse 2 they that have believing despots let them not despise them because they are brethren but rather do them service so the New Testament does give us the understanding that the word despot can be used in a good sense can be used to refer to God or the Lord Jesus Christ and not as we would sometimes understand it in the English to be always used in an evil or bad sense and I feel it's very significant that here in the Apocalypse chapter 6 that the word despot is used because they realize that he the Lord Jesus Christ in God himself was the only true real master or ruler 
who they were prepared to serve. And again, brethren and sisters, we should take note of these things. Our brethren and sisters were willing to die for the truth which they held. And I know many comments have been made here at the class in the discussions which have taken place that that may be the lot which we might have to endure as a time of trouble comes upon this world. And here we've got the exhortation from our brethren and sisters of past ages that for their belief in the gospel they were willing to die rather than serve uh, the uh, state as it was at that point in time. And because of that, in verse 11, Christ promises them something. He says, white robes were given unto every one of them. Again, if you want to make a marginal note, Re uh, Revelation 1 verse 18, 19 verse 8, where on many occasions we've looked at the idea of the white robes, the righteousness of the saints, the garments of victory, which will be given to those who overcome at the end of the day. And it's the Apostle John, who in the first of his epistles, and chapter 2, and at verse 25, adds these words. This is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. 1 John 2, verse 25. This is the promise he has promised us, even eternal life. And here those who had been willing to be sacrificed for their belief's sake, they in prospect, not in reality at that time, because obviously their reward will be our reward, God willing, when we all stand before the judge of the whole earth. But in prospect, white robes were given unto every one of them. This is the promise that we have, that we will be given eternal life if we faithfully follow and serve him. And so what more consolation did these people want? That they were being reminded that God is in control. Although they wanted a swift and speedy reaction to the persecution they were suffering, they were given that ultimate reward of everlasting life. And therefore, it was said unto every one of them that they should rest yet for a little season. And of course, the idea of rest is perhaps taken up by the psalm. Can we go to Psalm 94. Notice the context, brothers and sisters. Verse 1. O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth, O God, to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself. Lift up thyself, thou judge of the earth, render reward to the re proud. Yahweh, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? How long shall they utter and speak hard things, and all the workers of iniquity boast themselves? And we're coming down to verse 12. Blessed is the man whom thou chasteneth, O Yahweh, and teachest him out of thy law, that thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit be digged for the wicked. Thou will give him rest from the days of his adversity. And there was going to be rest for a little season, because they would lie sleeping in Jesus, until the time of the resurrection. He would reap vengeance for them on the earth, but they would be unaware. They would rest in him, awaiting that greater rest, as Hebrews chapter 4 says, which wait for the people of God. And the little season that they were to rest for, coming back to verse 11,
is in his good time. But there is an indication, as far as verse 11 is concerned, that although those who were actually dead would rest in him until the time of resurrection, those who were suffering, who were not actually souls under the altar, you'll notice at the end of verse 11, their fellow servants and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. There was going to be still more intense persecution until God would avenge their blood upon the earth. And there was going to be this period of time when the brethren and sisters would suffer greatly. But there does seem to be, to me, in that phrase at the end of verse 11, a distinction. We've got the fellow servants and we've got the brethren. Until their fellow servants, that's those who have been slain, whose souls were under the altar of verse 9, until their fellow servants and their brethren. And I believe we've got a distinction here between the true brethren and sisters and those who are termed fellow servants. And what I believe is being indicated in the idea of fellow servants are what we might use the term nominal believers or nominal Christians as opposed to those who literally believe what we believe who he is pleased to call brethren. Now, we should come against this idea again later on in the Apocalypse. When we come to chapter 12, and we don't propose to explain this till we come to chapter 12, but you'll notice in verse 16 of Revelation chapter 12, the earth helped the woman. And the woman in the chapter here is speaking of Christianity, speaking of believers. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So you've got the woman as an overall global situation. You've got those called the remnant which keep to the truth now that is what I believe we've got indicated in verse 11 of chapter 6 it could well be that we've got the idea well it, they were brethren and also they were fellow servants but I don't feel the scripture is indicating that it's indicating that they're fellow servants in other words people they associated with were killed as well as they were and also their brethren were also to be killed and it is significant and I can't prove it now here because I didn't bring the book with me but Gibbon in his decline and fall of the Roman Empire does show to us there was a distinction in the ranks of the Christians the one followed a man called Cornelius and he happened to be the Bishop of Rome. And there were others which followed Novativius, N-O-V-A-T-I-V-I-S. And those are termed as true Christians. And therefore, going on what not only Gibbon has to say, which I can't quote to you, my apologies, but also more particularly what verse 11 seems to say, although there were many believers so-called there was a majority who were classed as being only fellow servants as opposed to those who were truly to be called brethren and therefore the fifth seal was an indication of the intense destruction and murder the brethren and sisters and all those who held to any sort of Christianity would suffer at the hands of the Romans. 
Now again, I was going to quote to you from Gibbon to show how this intense persecution was a reality in the Roman Empire. Perhaps we can just for a few moments next time quote it to you, but if you want to make a note of it, Gibbon tells us that it was to last from the year AD 303 through to 311. AD 303 through to 311. And for those who might want to read more about it in Eureka, if they're following it, it's in volume 2, page 210 to 262. 210 to 262. But one of the remarkable facts of Gibbon is how much he emphasizes the way Christianity was tried to, uh, uh, um, the Roman Empire at that time tried to destroy Christianity. They tried to get rid of all those who believed in these things. And the Master promised to those who were faithful to endure will be given everlasting life at the end of the day. Again, I'm sorry I can't confirm this, but we'll try and do that next time. So let's quickly move on to the sixth seal in verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of air, the moon became as blood, the stars of heaven fell unto the ground, uh, unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains, the mighty men, every bondman, freeman, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? And there we have got it pictorial on the chart which is on the board where it is describing heaven as a scroll which is going to be rolled away. The sun was to be black, the moon was to be as blood, the stars were to fall upon to the earth, all the kings of the earth, the great men and all of them were to hide themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And if you look closely, you will find there are caves, there are dens where the men have hid themselves. And that is the graphic upheaval which is being described under the sixth seal. And with that question, we cannot help but notice that there is a tremendous upheaval whatever has been described. The whole tenor of the sixth seal is something which is revolutionary, something which is going to be completely different from what that has gone before. And that's why the opening of verse 12, we are told there was a great earthquake. A great earthquake. And the sun became black. Now, as we've seen many times before, we are not dealing in the apocalypse with literal things. We are dealing with those things which are being represented. And we have seen before, when we are speaking of things of the heaven and earth, it's speaking on a political basis, not on a spiritual one. And therefore, when we think of the great earthquake and the sun becoming black and the moon becoming blood, we don't think that it literally has or will happen. There is no such thing as the sun becoming black in a literal sense, or the moon becoming blood. And therefore, the earthquake which is mentioned here is not the earthquake which is going to take place at the time when the Lord Jesus Christ is in the earth, when Mount Olivet splits, and there's going to be a great shaking in the land of Israel. And the reason for that will become apparent as we go through the description which is given. First of all, We've got the sun, moon, and stars. Now, as we have seen again on previous occasions, 
the sun, moon and stars represent the ruling powers of the day. Do you remember again, to remind you, of Joseph's dream? When he saw the sun, the moon and the stars bow before him, and we are told what they represent. They represented his family as they would give obeisance to him. We've gone to Isaiah before, we've gone to Deuteronomy before. When Moses and the prophet were saying, Give ear, O heaven, and hear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Now we never imagined, as we have seen, for him to be literally going out and sort of addressing the sky up above and the ground beneath. He was talking to the rulers of the heavenlies of that age and the earth, the people that are ruled. And that's the situation we have got here. We have got the sun, the moon and the stars of the political heavens of whatever situation is being described becoming black as sackcloth of hair, the moon becoming as blood and the stars of the heaven falling unto the earth even as a fig tree casteth her untimely um, figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Now, can we take you back to Isaiah chapter 13? Verse 9. Isaiah 13, verse 9. Behold, the day of Yahweh cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven, and the consolations thereof, shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogance of the proud to cease, and lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Now what's Isaiah describing in chapter 13? Is it the day which is yet to come upon the earth? The answer is no. Verse 1 tells us who he is referring to. The burden of Babylon. And what is being described in chapter 13 of Isaiah is the destruction of the city of Babylon. But he describes it as the stars of heaven not giving their light, the sun being darkened, the moon not being able to shine. But what he is speaking of is the ruling powers in the Babylonian Empire being eclipsed, being extinguished. And of course we know how it was happened by the fact of the Medo-Persian army coming upon them. And so in verse 9 of chapter 13 he says, And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, it shall never be inhabited. Neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there, etc, etc. The whole of the chapter is speaking about the eclipse of the power that once ruled the world. Now those symbologies are brought forward now into the sixth seal of the Apocalypse chapter 14. First of all we are told it's a time of great upheaval. There is a great earthquake now those things are not written without them having some specific meaning. And then we are told that the ruling powers, the sun, the moon, and the stars of heaven will fall to the earth or be eclipsed, and he describes the stars as the fig tree casting forth her untimely figs. But then we notice, and this is what gives us the clue to the correct understanding of the time period, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. The scroll was described as heaven being rolled away. 
That's very descriptive, we must agree. Again, we've got a parallel. Can we go back to Isaiah again? And this time, the 34th chapter. Verse 1. Come near ye nations to me, hearken ye people, let the earth hear, and all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it, for the indignation of Yahweh is upon all nations, and his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them, he hath delivered them to the slaughter, their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, the mountain shall be melted with their blood, and all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and notice, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all the host shall fall down, as the leaf falleth up from the vine, as a falling fig from the fig tree. Notice the same graphic picture as we've got in the Apocalypse. But what did the prophet Isaiah refer to? The answer is given. Verse 5. My sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Ijumea and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The sword of Yahweh is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and of goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For Yahweh hath a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Ijumea. And you probably all know what is referred to as Ijumea. Eden is a more common name for Ijumea. And what Isaiah 34 is describing is the overthrow and the destruction of Eden. Now what was so symbolic about that as far as the sixth chapter of the Apocalypse was concerned? Well consider, Edom is spoken of many times in the prophets and God was utterly going to destroy Edom from off the face of the world. And at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, Edom had gone. How? Because he brought upon them the Maccabees. And it was the Maccabees who gave them an ultimatum. They either had to be converted to Judaism or perish. And we've got many prophets which describe the utter <coughs> annihilation of the country and the people of Edom. There's very good reasons, which you've probably considered before, why this was to be. But the principle was, as, as Isaiah here, verse, uh, chapter 34 says, there was going to be terrible judgments which were brought upon the land of Edom. And he describes it in verse 4, as all the host of heaven shall be dissolved and the heaven shall be rolled together as a scroll. So in other words, it's rolled up and that's the end of Eden. It was not something which was to perpetually continue. It was come to an untimely end as a fig as it drops to the floor. It was describing something that was final and total. And I think we would have to agree when you think of a scroll being rolled up it indicates that something is finished it's the end of the matter now when we come to the apocalypse we're obviously using the same basis for interpretation but this time we're not thinking of Babylon we're not thinking of Eden we're thinking of something which has been used before to describe those powers and we can apply the, symboli the, the symbolism, I'll say that word right one of these days, the symbolism to what we've got in the sixth seal. So knowing, because that was the sign which Charles was to give me, that time was up, we're going to leave it there, perhaps for you to be thinking about it, and we'll pick up the thought next time in the sixth seal, when God willing, if I can remember, I will bring the books which support these things, but we'll also consider how the apocalyptic writer uses the symbols of the past to describe the great earthquake which was to take place in those days.
So I'm sorry we're halfway through something, but you know we can't always finish so very conveniently. But next time, God willing, we shall conclude chapter 6 of the Apocalypse, and therefore we shall move off the historical period for a while to come to chapter 7, where we have some glorious pictures of the kingdom. So as I've said before, I know history is not always that palatable, but please bear with us as we try and explain the symbols of the seals so that we can remember the things which our brethren and sisters of past ages have suffered.